when the app stores came out and developers started building solutions, it's not many years, like 10 mm -hmm. years that today you can find any app that you want. I think it's very similar to the wearable space and to the sensor space. You have now fantastic data. I think you have fantastic devices. And then the key now is what are we building on top of that information? Welcome back to the Fit Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Veneri. Today, I'm joined by Terra CEO, Kyriakis Eleftherio. In this episode, we discuss the company's mission to increase the utility of health data. We explore the evolution of health wearables, including uses for fitness, performance, and healthcare. Plus, we talk about what it takes to build a world-class team, culture, and product. Let's get into it. The Fit Insider Podcast is brought to you by Jack Taylor, our exclusive PR partner. More than just PR, they're creative storytellers and brand builders who actually understand the health and wellness industry. To learn more, head to fit.co slash Jack Taylor. That's F-I-T-T dot C-O slash Jack Taylor. Kiriakos, welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, pretty excited. Yeah, looking forward to the conversation. I know, obviously, I've been following the company for quite a while now. It's exciting to see actually how things have grown and I think all the various ways that as the industry kind of evolves, you're very well positioned to kind of fill some of the opportunities that are being created. We'll get into all that. But for people who aren't familiar, why don't you just give us the, the quick backstory, tell us about what you're working on, then we'll jump into the conversation. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invite. Um, I'm, the, I'm Kiriakos. I'm the CEO of Terra. The origin story of Terra was roughly two and a half years ago where we saw a problem with wearables. I was in the Special Forces for a number of years, and I had to improve my performance. And uh, the first thing I've done is uh, I started buying wearables. I bought a Polar Heart Rate Monitor, and then I bought a, a Nike shoe pod, if you remember these. And I started improving my performance with the wearables, and I got really, really hooked into the space. So I started buying more and more over time. But there was a big problem uh, all the times. Uh, it was just impossible to connect this data to other apps. Um, how about my Spotify? How, how about my Netflix? How about all of these um, uh, apps and technologies that could take advantage of my data uh, and improve my lifestyle? I was speaking about this with my co-founder back in the day, and we came up uh, with the idea, why don't we just make it super easy for um, uh, apps to access that information by building an API? And then we immediately got into Y Combinator, uh, raised funds from General Catalyst, and we had some great support from folks like uh, Next Ventures and Lance Armstrong and Tom Blomfield from Monzo uh, that came on board. And we started the journey by building the API that makes it easy for apps to connect wearables and sensors. And then over time, the origin story became something much, much bigger. Because now we are closer and closer to be the infrastructure of healthcare, uh, where one, it enables developers to access data, uh, such as wearables, such as sensors, such as any health data of dynamic fashion. But then we're building a lot of products uh, over time as well. So a developer today can hook up uh, with API and then go immediately live because they have uh, the authentications for the front end, and then they have their graphs for the front end, and then they also have, we're using ChatGPT now, so they can embed ChatGPT. So it's this infrastructure that makes it easier and easier and easier for uh, developers to go immediately live with the products that they think in healthcare by using Terra. And this really expanded, you know, it expanded into not only healthcare, you would expect healthcare um, apps to be using that information, but then immediately you see a lot of social apps uh, accessing Terra, a lot of telemedicine companies accessing Terra, a lot of diabetes companies accessing Terra. And then you see the average app, like uh, you see apps you would never expect, or you, you see clinical studies being contacted on this data. And the, the question we are really solving is, how can we increase the utility of healthcare data? 
how can we enable technology companies like Spotify to play the right song at the right time based on your heart rate? Or a company like Netflix to play the right movie based on your stress levels and enable every technology company in the world uh, to access that information? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I think a lot of times, and I'd be curious to, to see how you thought about it, you know, it's not dissimilar from a lot of folks that I talk to or even myself, like you were in the special forces. Um, my brother and co-founder Anthony was in the Marine Corps. You know, I was a college athlete and then a triathlete. And we get enamored by these devices and this data and how do we optimize performance? We start, at least I did, it sounds like you too, like buying everything, trying everything, dialing in your nutrition, dialing in your sleep. And sure, over time, maybe the goals evolve, right? For performance or military or running faster or sleeping better or just longevity in general. And then at some point, you know, if you're deep enough into it, you, you're in also like this kind of startup world. You're like, okay, how do I build a company around this? Or how do I make my performance better? Or how do I, you know, help other people do the same thing? And most people immediately kind of go to like, okay, I'm going to build this consumer app. I'm going to build the consumer app that I want or that my friends would want. But in your case, you kind of said, well, what if we enabled anybody who's building anything to kind of tap into this data? Was it a consideration around consumer applications of this and maybe building a company down that path? Or how did you ultimately arrive at like, oh no, let's unlock all of the data from like a developer API perspective? Hmm. I think at the very beginning, I was thinking about consumer apps. But intentionally, I was trying to think, how can we really create value on scale? How can we really create value on millions of people? And to do that, you really need to address a much bigger population. And the way I was thinking about it is, if you really build one app today, then it's going to be really difficult. You have to focus on a specific niche. You have to, to focus on a specific type. And then... Um, it's a very different proposition. And since my, I had some experience in business as well in the past, and I was, I was thinking, why don't we just, how, how do we expand this? Uh, and I think by being the middle layer uh, and being in the position that we help every other company, it just becomes so much more valuable. In, in doing that, going down that path, recognizing the scale and the potential to have potentially a much larger impact at that time, were you then basically betting it's only going to be more? There's only going to be more devices. There's only going to be more companies who are tapping into it. How did you think about it? It was only right a couple of years ago at this point, but kind of have you been surprised maybe even at how quickly the, the interest and in the number of sensors and the number of devices and the number of companies who want to use that data? And, and how do you think about that opportunity now as it continues to evolve? Yeah, I think that at the beginning, you always think the obvious that a sports app or a fitness app would want that information. But what we've seen from Terra today are really, really exciting things. Like universities like Imperial College and Stanford uh, have their own wearables department. Um, and they access wearables and create clinical studies. Or you have all the big um, clinical studies and pharmaceuticals uh, that want to access the information for their own purposes. And then you see companies into the, the social space. We, we always say about the, the music apps uh, similar to Spotify, but there are like 50 companies similar to these that are creating song recommendations based on your heart rate today, building on top of, of Terra. And it's just a very, very small fraction of a very surprising type of company that you would never expect. And then there are folks like Eight Sleep, like they're improving your sleep by regulating uh, the temperature, or there are so many folks into the mental health space, so many folks in so many different aspects. I would never expect at the beginning that this would happen. Um, I was estimating at the beginning that, look, this could be a technology for the healthcare apps and the fitness apps, um, but, our mission is to increase the utility of healthcare data. And the more we push towards this direction, the more apps that you would never expect to use that information come and use it. Yeah, there's, it's only continuing to grow in the opportunities and the use cases. And that's 
kind of the interesting thing about taking the approach that you have, which is that it's not even incumbent upon you to decide what the use case is. You're just kind of saying, here you go. Here's how you would do it. Um, I guess maybe taking a step back for folks who aren't familiar, maybe they're not a developer, right? They don't know how to access an API, maybe don't even know what it is. How would you then explain, you know, you say, oh, they're building on top of Terra or they're integrating this data. Is, is there a simplified version to kind of say, this is the turnkey process that we enable and maybe here's what that might look like? Yeah, so the key here is um, always part of what we're building is making it easier and easier and easier for anyone to use the API. So from an API at the beginning, it became an SDK, and from an SDK, it also became front components. So basically, we're reaching towards the point that anyone that wants to build an app today can start using Terra, and they should they shouldn't know much about how an API works, or they shouldn't know much about how do I build a front-end component. They can use Terra to build their health app or to build an app that is going to use healthcare data that are of a dynamic fashion. Uh, and we make it so easy that is at a certain point is going to be like uh, a no-code um, platform. Like the ease of use is really key of what we're building today. Yeah, and that, even that piece of it, from the initial inception of the company to now thinking about almost, yes, how do you increase the utility of the, the healthcare data? But it's like, how do we enable anybody to build an app from scratch that then taps into this? Have you thought about, or I guess, are there specific use cases that you would speak to that are most surprising to you, most impressive, or most kind of indicative of, the potential of utilizing this data and even the how the platform has transformed beyond like, oh, me as you mentioned, Eight Sleep, wanting to tap into this to integrate other data, folks that are kind of coming to it either from scratch or at a very basic level and then able to, to kind of turn something on. I can go a, a bit more uh, in depth into this uh, and speak about a problem that usually I don't. If, if you see for the last, um, I don't know, let's just say 50 years, the way that we have been looking at healthiness in a, in a very static fashion. You would go, for example, to a doctor, you would do a blood analysis, and you would receive a static sample. For example, you would measure your blood, and you would see my glucose level is X at that point in the morning. And then you would test yourself again one year afterwards. And then what the medic would do would basically compare you with the population with that static value. Now, what happens in this case is we're accessing dynamic information. Like we can see your HRV or we, we can see your deep sleep levels or we can get biomarkers like glucose 24-7. And by accessing that information, an engineer or a developer or a scientist can see that data in a much, much different way because you can constantly iterate around the information and build a product that, for example, is always looking at your glucose and notifies you when you eat the wrong meal. So I, I, I love the companies like Levels and Super Sabians and Ultra Human that they, they are doing something similar, but they basically proven that we're taking dynamic data and we're just improving so much what we have done in the past. And the, the thing is that doctors, whenever I speak to a, a friend doctor or uh, or someone relative or uh, anything like this, they are overworked. They can never, like, they don't have the time to go and see at your data and say, this is what you need to do and be very, very careful with it. Whereas if you build an AI model on top of that, or that makes it very easy for uh, an app to create recommendations, because it constantly looks at your data. GPT constantly looks at your data and then gives you specific recommendations of here's how you need to train if you want to increase your performance or here's how you need to eat in order for you to avoid having this disease uh, and then you see so many use cases and i'm so excited about ChatGPT, for example because you're basically feeding uh, you can feed a model um uh, all of this information and then give you recommendations that are very relevant to you so back to the topic of really surprising use cases, I would say we are going to see a lot coming from AI. 
we um we are going to see a lot coming in sleep for example um we are going to see a lot coming into mental health um even i saw the announcement of uh aura last week that I was super excited about that basically they said you can see how your colleagues slept so you can make a more educated and informed decision of how you should be replying and all of that. I think that is going to be much uh, bigger over time because you are going to have much more data, much more devices, and you're going to be wearing it on your clothes, for example. Your, your shirt is going to be measuring your blood pressure. Your pants are going to be measuring your HRV. Uh, there are so many sensors I see nowadays that are measuring the force that you exert from your shoes. Um, and the more of that information we have, which is very long tail, the more the solutions we never imagined. Like, I'm super excited by someone coming and building, for example, uh, something to measure my workouts. Me going to the gym and actually knowing how, I, how much I lift every time so I can progress at the end. Because I was speaking with the, the founder of Strava in the, in the podcast the other day as well, and I, I was just mentioning that there's just no Strava for weightlifters. Right. It's, because it's just so difficult to measure the weight, uh, the weight that you lift. But if you have in your shoe a sensor that measures the force, uh, like that, that the folks at Plantiga are doing, um, it would be really excited solutions. And you see, it's it goes from weightlifting to cycling to even hospitals that are using Terra today to to see, for example, if someone's uh, HRV changed. So they potentially know if uh, if they might have COVID or a disease to let them know, come to the practice and they can uh, deliver uh, treatment much earlier. Yeah, I think, we in many ways sit in a similar position in that we're looking at all the various companies and applications. Yeah, we're we're users of them and we're thinking about performance and health and longevity. And we're excited about the potential and still recognizing different opportunities. And that like, to me, it, it couldn't be more frustrating that everything is so fragmented that even, right, I'm telling you as if you, you don't know, right, and trying to to build the solution for this, but but still to the fact that if I wanted to quantify my strength training workouts, well, that's different than a device that I would use to quantify my sleep and that maybe it's an eight sleep or an aura and that's different from a thing that I would do from my running or cycling and then putting it into one place and so I'm constantly in my mind going back and forth between like, is this creating more work and confusion for the user, whether that's an athlete or somebody that's, you know, much older and just looking at fall risk or Alzheimer's prevention or stroke, uh, cardiovascular disease, or are we getting are we actually progressing such that we're we're moving closer to all of this making sense in a predictive, preventative fashion. Um, so when you kind of line some of these things up from the sensors to the integrations that, that you're enabling to uh, AI and, and different emerging kind of ways to decipher this data, how how close are we? Is it within reach? Are we making kind of like the um, meaningful progress there or is it still a ways to go until we're able to do it in a way that it is like truly predictive? What I'm reminded these days is the Nokia phones. Mm -hmm. I think back in the day, we had some fantastic phones with Nokia and the hardware was fantastic. But they were called smartphones, but they weren't really smart. <laughs> and then Apple came along and then Google came along with Android and basically they built that software enablement that enabled all the developers to come and build on top. And they just improved the utility of the data so much more than what we could do before. Yeah, I had a camera on an Nokia phone. Like, I'm, 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 I'm not that old, but uh, I remember these days. I have a camera there. I had a radio. I had, I had so many features on it, but it was just so difficult to use them. And when the app stores came out and developers started building solutions and it was fascinating. Um, it's not many years, like it's 10 years that today you can find any app that you want. 
I think it's very, very similar to the wearable space uh, and to the sensor space. You have now fantastic data. I think you have fantastic devices. And then the key now is, what are we building on top of that information? Uh, because the, something really, really interesting is looking at dynamic data basically gives us an idea of how the human body functions from the first principles uh, level. And if you constantly see data, then you can build solutions that are going to be really, really helpful. And I think that that example of the phones is what happened to the wearable space. And the solutions that we see on a daily basis are really, really exciting. And that basically prove that the more we push towards this direction, the more we push towards Let's make it easier and easier and easier for apps to build on top of that and for developers to take advantage of it. The more we're getting closer to the iPhone moment and accessing uh, information. And and let's not be mistaken, by the way, like you have so many movies like the Moneyball and um, that we've seen in the past that they just use the data in so different ways and they change the whole industry altogether. Um, so I think that you had a lot of examples uh, in doing that. For example, with Aura, uh, seeing what they have done with temperature and that they can predict pregnancies two weeks before that usually a doctor would know. Uh, so you see this constantly happening, but I think over time, the easier it becomes for the data to be accessible, the more products are going to be built, the more developers are going to be interested, and it's the more fantastic solutions that you never expect are going to be being built on top. Yeah, I think thinking about it, from the phone perspective is interesting because it's then you start to get into basically operating systems right and so the the app store and apple enabling access to these other applications and use cases which then in my mind there's also this conversation at the same time where it's like it's not uncommon now for somebody to be wearing multiple devices they're wearing the Aura Ring, they're wearing a Whoop Band, they're wearing an Apple Watch, they're wearing a glucose monitor. Maybe they do have the Plantiga insoles. They're sleeping on an eight sleep. It's like, are we continuing to go in that direction where you have a device and a sensor for everything? Or is there some kind of transitional point where it's like, we just stop thinking about the devices altogether? Or there's, you know, there's a couple of different paths, right? There's like sensors everywhere, right? Such that they're ambient. You don't even think about them. And then there's also like an iPhone, for example, a super device or a super operating system that everything kind of happens from this one place. Do you have an opinion or a perspective on like, is there going to be a device for everything? Is there going to be a device and an operating system to rule them all? Maybe that is Apple where they, where they want to be all along or will it unfold in stages? Hey everyone, we'll get you back to the show in just a second. But first, I wanted to tell you about our exclusive PR partner, Jack Taylor. Honestly, this one's a no-brainer. We've known the Jack Taylor team for years. They work with some of the most innovative health and wellness companies. We're talking Whoop, Athletic Greens, Hyperice, and many more. Jack Taylor has an extensive industry network, knows how to work with high-growth companies, and really invests in building long-term relationships. I know this firsthand because they're Fit Insider's PR agency so I can confidently recommend them, and I do all the time. From startups to more established brands, they go beyond pushing product to help companies truly thrive. To learn more, head to fit.co slash Jack Taylor. That's F-I-T-T dot C-O slash Jack Taylor. Now back to the show. I mean, I can tell you from what I see today, and then also I can tell you what, what I would like to see. I think there are going to be more and more sensors over time because there are just so many biomarkers that we can measure. So the likes of Dexcom and uh, Abbott uh, that are measuring uh, your glucose, for example, or the, the likes of Venavitals that are measuring your blood pressure and um, Flowbio that is measuring your uh, sweat analytics, we're going to have more and more of these devices coming to the market because of the complexity of measuring more biomarkers. It's very complex, it's very expensive, uh, and then it takes really big companies to be pursuing them. And then the nature of it requires a lot of patents and uh, and so on. So basically, you're going to have more and more uh, of these devices, and we constantly see that. And I think that 
my guess is that the industry is going to move to a point that you will not care that much about the sensor. You're just going to be wearing, you're going to be wearing a shirt that's going to have something that is embedded. I've seen these uh, shirts lately that they bed wires and uh, they can measure your uh, HRV and your heart rate. There is, the more the time, the more we're going to see them embedded in our clothes and in, in, in our, our everyday lives. And so it has to be basically be removed from you remembering that you are wearing something, but it's going to be always there measuring. And then more uh, uh, more solutions are going to be built on top. I think that's that's my guess. That's uh, what's going to happen. Now what's happening right now today, it's like more and more sensors coming into the market. So that's that's the today's reality. Yeah, I, it's it's interesting to think about. And it's something that, yeah, I personally, I guess, go back and forth on because I do find myself in a fortunate position that, you know, I get to try out a lot of the technology, whether people are sending it or, you know, I'm buying it to test it. But rarely do I stick with something after I kind of get a hang of, oh, I wore the glucose monitor. Oh, this was surprising. I got this insight. And now I'll change, you know, whatever my habit is around that with that learning. But a lot of the other stuff was kind of to be expected. So I stopped using it or I, you know, get this, I get a sense for, oh, this is good for my sleep. This is bad for my sleep. And then I kind of stopped using it. I, I almost, like you said, what I, what I wish, or maybe what I think might happen, um, is to the point where there's just no friction. What's I don't even know what's happening. I don't even have to think about it. And then I'm just getting do this, do that, or, Hey, you might just in terms of predicting sickness or disease or whatever, if you continue this thing, this is what's going to happen on the other side. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm now more and more starting to look for and plan for solutions or companies that I think can really fill that white space while also being aware of kind of the lag, even in the technology, right? That it will probably continue to be sensors and solutions that are attacking them one at a time until we have a better understanding such that we can build those models and, and integrate that technology more seamlessly. Yeah. Closing closing the loop is very important. Um, one of the companies that is doing it so well, and I love them so much, is Aid Sleep. Mm. Uh, because basically, I was not sleeping before using Aid Sleep. And then Aid Sleep, the, the great thing that they do is that they access your data and then they regulate the temperature without you doing anything. And I think this is very important. Accessing the data is uh, is the first part of the equation, but then the key is for me to require no intervention and for me not needing to do anything in order for me to have uh, an improvement. So the, the, the mattress regulates the temperature. I sleep much better. I don't care about my data. They just remain there. And I think that's that's really the key here. Getting these type of solutions that use your data in a way that you don't need to do anything but the machine itself and the app itself is doing all the work without your intervention. Yeah, I think that that will continue to be the game changer, right? That those more and more from sleep to you name the different kind of pillar or aspect of health, when that starts happening and you don't have to think about it, um, yeah, that's a huge unlock. Circling back to Terra quickly, um, right now, I also wanted to get a sense for, you know, you're talking about continuing to build the platform to enable the, the ease of use people come to it. You really don't have to know anything, right, to get started and make the integrations and continue to, you know, democratize and in increase the utility of this healthcare data. What does that look like now in terms of the team roadmap, how you're like now thinking about these recognizing that the use cases are going to continue to evolve the the kind of sensors are also continuing to evolve how are you thinking about oh this is how i'm building the team and the roadmap to then account for some of these things whether it's shifts in demand you've identified or things that you're kind of um you know kind of betting on into the future where there's a little less certainty maybe yep so basically when when you want to reach a future that is Spotify is using that information and Netflix is using that information uh, and, uh, and so on. You need to have a number of things. Uh, one, things need to be real time. 
So we're working directly with a lot of wearable companies in order to help them, in order how to build their APIs, in order to for them to go and start thinking about how do we do everything real time. And that's that's the one pillar. It's having real time information is very important. Then second, it's having a lot of insights, making it very easy for these folks to access insights constantly and building basically all the tools to enable that reality to exist. Uh, so we have this, this vision, we have this goal, and we have this as a direction. Now, in order to get there, the really interesting part of Terra is that we're just so passionate about people. It's we're doing... Uh, me and my co-founder are just spending countless hours every day doing interviews and trying to get the best people in the world to join. And we have a very, very, very high bar in talent, but it needs to, every new person that you add to the team, it needs to increase the average intelligence of the team. So we are very, very strict, uh, but we are very, very focused on the culture. So. Everybody that, that joins Terra uh, needs to be able to get things done. They need to be able to, the, the rate of learning matters most, uh, not so much experience, the rate of learning matters most. And then they're really humble people that are joining the company, uh, that we are really hungry to be building this together. So the, the central pillar for Terra that we, we don't speak about often is that we are very, very focused on building the best team in the world. This requires the best talent in the world. It needs. Uh, it requires a lot of first principles thinking. It requires a lot of engineering, um, and then it requires a lot of operations and so on. But we are very, very, very focused on that. When you're as you're talking about it, and I, I'm sure this won't be a surprise to you, um, it reminds me of talking with a levels team when they they talk about how we're approaching culture, why we're doing it you know, hiring the best kind of talent in the world, making sure that they're aligned with the mission, they're aligned with, you know, in their case, like fully remote asynchronous, which I'm sure you share a lot of those things. But for other people who might be in the CEO role, like that's easier said than done, right? Nobody wants to hire the worst talent in the world or the mediocre talent to join their team. How you know, we could probably do an entire podcast just on this piece of it, but uh, maybe if there's a, a, a kind of through line or, or key takeaway, it's like, what does that even look like when you say, you know, the best talent in the world and making sure how you can go about identifying, like, are they aligned? Are they, a, a, you know, somebody who can get things done and work and be accountable and think from first principles and all those things? Um, because, you know, like I said, easier said than done in terms of identifying that and then, you know, making sure that you can consistently over time uphold that standard. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the toughest things out there. Uh, mentioning levels, I love levels. They have been uh, building a fantastic product over time. I've been speaking to them so often and they have been very helpful. I would say we have the opposite view of levels when it comes to hiring. Uh, mm -hmm. They're completely remote. We are completely in person. Um, uh, we're based, we have one office in London and another office in San Francisco. And the question I ask myself all the times is, would I be able to recreate the special forces team remotely? Mm -hmm. And the honest answer is, for us, it's no. And the reason is because Teams become really great teams when they struggle together, when they have very complex problems that they have to solve. And the, the, the organic conversations that happen and the organic problem solving that happens in the office, it's very, very difficult to replicate. I'm, I'm, I'm more of the, I'm really aligned mostly with uh, the views of Peter Thiel or um, uh, Keith Raboy, for example, and uh, Vinod Kosla on this. But we are very, very, focused on really building a culture that everybody is in person, everybody gets to work with someone else on a daily basis. We have a lot of small teams. Each team has four people. We don't increase more than four people because early on we realized that 
the unit of productivity doesn't really increase with the amount of people. Um, it has to be really small teams that are able to operate by themselves. They do not need guidance and that they can get things done all the times and they are willing to learn as fast as possible. And the more you expand, like if you if you go more than 10 people in one team, more than more than that, it basically breaks. So when you come to Terra, it's basically a lot of small teams, uh, four, four people in each team that basically demonstrate something like a small startup uh, within like multiple small startups within a bigger startup. And I think when... In, in the question of how you do it, I think it's so difficult. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I was looking at some numbers before our call. In every 500 interviews we do, one person passes the interviews. And I, I can't find a way that is more efficient than this. Obviously, we're improving over time and this improves, but you have to be constantly doing 500 interviews to find one fantastic candidate to join the team. Things are actually difficult, like we're like building integrations and building the future of healthcare and building an infrastructure is really, really difficult. It's really, really complex. So you need people that are really, really hungry to learn, that are really, really smart, and they like working with each other. It took us a while to get there, but I think now things are working very well. And the, the interesting part is like, you come every day, like I come every day here and in all the problems that you've, you see in front of you, you see someone that has fantastic perspectives and you, and it always, it's it's so exciting all the times. Um, we, we kind of recreated this university environment that you would go there. It was pretty flexible when you join and all that. And then everybody works hard because everybody has a goal and we have some, some similar of that. And then, I think that's uh, that's very important uh, overall. I think yeah, I'm glad that we kind of landed on this topic because I think your perspective is is super interesting. And there's also this almost I don't know what the counter narrative is at this point because it's almost like people initially pushing for only in office, then remote. Now there are very and you name some of them uh, staunch kind of supporters of like no, you can only do this. Uh, in an in in-person setting, part of that, you know, I agree with. Again, having grown up playing sports, it's like, well, there is. I couldn't at that point in time fathom building a team, especially a super high-performing team that wasn't suffering together and spending that time together and and having that sense of like in-person camaraderie. I have different opinions now, potentially in terms of like how to attract and maybe scale a, a workforce. But I think the interesting thing is like there are so many ways to do it. There are, there are different ways to do it. And it's about building that culture and philosophy. And I think in your case, because it is so important to have this kind of special forces replicated in person that like, that's where you are, you have conviction around it. And that's, that's conveyed to the people that you're hiring. And ultimately for you, that is a benefit and attracts those people. Whereas for somebody who is totally asynchronous, like that resonates with them for that same reason. So ultimately you're able to get what you want with totally kind of different or, or opposing almost thought processes. Yeah. I think what really matters a lot is when you have a philosophy and you keep being consistent. Mm. I, for example, the folks at levels, probably they're the best in the world at being remote. And they are so consistent with it. The only company I think that are so great at it, I think it's probably GitLab or uh, that I met in the past and, and they're fantastic. Uh, but what really matters is that as long as you have a philosophy and you say, this is the way that things work based on what we learned in the past, you just need to be consistent on it over, uh, over time. Um, I think where things fall apart is when you're not consistent in a way that you say, you know what, we, we're we going to do something in person, but we are also going to do it remotely. And then you, w when you're trying to go for everything, um, I think something is going to work based on consistency. Yeah, I think this is maybe something 
the more that we talk again, we could probably I get, just keep talking about culture and hiring and team and um, maybe something to revisit in a different setting, maybe even with someone like you, someone from levels talk and like talk about the the different approaches. So we'll, we'll circle back to that, but, but wrapping up this conversation and potentially, you know, getting you out of here, like there's the things continuing to evolve very quickly. The, the ways that in which you're approaching that, how that aligns with the, the evolution of wearables and sensors and, and use cases for data across performance, general health, healthcare, so on. Looking ahead for you now, is there one thing, a few things that you kind of think about as like the key milestones or, or focus areas? Is it continuing now focus on team? Is it focusing on revenue, making sure things are tied up from the business model perspective? Is it fundraising, maybe some combination of some of those things? How do you think about kind of key benchmarks and, and kind of what we should look out for uh, kind of going forward from you? Something very important is that you always have to consider, yeah, speaking about revenues, you always have to consider, are my revenues growing on a consistent basis month on month? I think that was very important from the very early on for Terra. It's let's not only build something that is valuable for people, but let's make this last. And to make the company last, you really need to be thinking about, is the business growing? Is the, are the revenues growing? Is the monthly recurring uh, revenues uh, growing? Uh, but then, so, so it's like, that's a foundation, but the really interesting part is engagement. If we're constantly working with all the customers and we're adamant on having support all the times because we are working close, close with our customers, we are building faster and faster what they want. And we are productizing many solutions to make it easier and easier for them to access more data, getting faster to the market, accessing more products and making their users' life much easier. So one is the revenues, yes. Second, it's really working very, very close with our customers. Third is helping the industry evolve. Um, like we're working so close with all the wearable companies, all the sensor companies. And our strategy for the beginning was very long-term partnerships. So it's like we have very strong partnerships with Aura. We have very strong partnerships with Wahoo. Everybody in the space, we're trying to do everything we can to increase the size of this space increase what we can do to the wearable companies and help them and the sensor companies. And then, uh, so that's that's a third key point for importance. Um, but like, there is none of the three that I can emphasize, but also it's building the team. Like, as I, the, the very important thing is, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about culture, how do we bring the best people in the world how do we make sure that the best people in the world are working at the most uh, optimized manner and that they are happy at the company and we're working as a unit? Uh, that is very important. I think those uh, four things are, are so important. I, I really like some of the things coming from YC that build what users want. We're just so, so focused on utility, improving uh, the product. Uh, so we make sure that our user experience is improved. And then focusing so much on culture and making sure that the team is fantastic and uh, that everybody um, enjoys the process and that we are building for a big cause. I think I think all those things and even the the point that you mentioned that resonates with me and why I was honestly so excited for this conversation is because I think we approach it in a similar way is that I just want the entire industry to be better to to better serve users to increase access to make people healthier like to 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 bring more talent to the space to bring more funding to the space in your case it's yet yeah, it's specific to you know some of these partners and, and sensors and, and companies building that that you can align right the the kind of value proposition if if they're succeeding you're succeeding right because they're hopefully just going to continue to use you know your solution but at a much higher level for conversations like this for fit insiders like hey we don't we just want everybody 
that's trying to solve this problem around making people making people healthier. Like we want to support all of them. Um, so yeah, it's exciting to think about that in terms of the work that you're doing, building this team, you know, supporting and enabling other solutions that, that have a similar mission. Um, yeah. And so I guess just in wrapping up, where would you point people across all those things uh, that, that you mentioned, talent, continue to build the team, focusing on long-term partnerships, um, potential partners, right, who may be listening that want to utilize Terra to, to build or, or improve um, their product. Best way to get in touch, just check out the website. Uh, obviously, I hope this conversation um, was beneficial in that. But yeah, where would you point people? Many ways, we are very, very vocal in general. In the website, <laughs> there is something that is a feature which most people think it's a bug, which if you click on support, it goes directly to my email. Uh, <laughs> so it's easy to find um, and navigate across people because uh, you can connect uh, directly to me. And then we have channels on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn that we're very, very responsive on. And across the website, our blog, we have podcasts and so on. But we are very open in general. We are very uh, vocal and most of the media you can find us in, in every social media out there. Also for hiring and so on, uh, it's a classic ways from uh, from the website and so on. Perfect. Yeah. We'll make sure everything is is linked up, easy to find. And um, yeah, people people have a direct line to you, which is uh, a bold move. Like you said, some, some people think maybe a mistake. It's not, but no. it's not the best idea, but uh, but it gets me to see, like it gives you a bird's eye view many times in, oh, there's this problem happening or there's these uh, new clients that want to speak and, and so on. So uh, most of the times that's available and uh, uh, it's a feature, not a bug. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much for making time today. Really enjoyed the conversation. And yeah, excited to continue to, to watch things, not only at Terra, but kind of across the landscape evolve. And then, you know, where you fit into to continuing to increase this utility around the data. Excellent, Joe. Thank you so much. One more thing before you head out. Help us spread the word. Take a minute to rate and view the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, or share this episode with a friend. And if you like conversations like this, you'll love the Fit Insider newsletter. We send it every Tuesday. The link is in the description. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you back here next week.